What is a chemistry lecture doing in a biology class? Well, biology needs chemistry. All of science is interdisciplinary, meaning all of science works together to better understand observations in the natural world. So today we are going to briefly review some chemistry to make sure we're all on the same page in future lectures. Before you even begin listening to this lecture, be sure that you've read chapter two in your textbook and that you've turned off your phones and minimized all distractions. Turn off music, listen to this recording in a quiet space, take plenty of notes on the chapter, and then combine those notes with the notes that you'll take during this lecture. Today we will be discussing atoms, molecular structure and function, as well as briefly touch on chemical reactions that are necessary for biological life. During the lecture, we will use both text and images to convey the information. If it's on the slide, you are responsible for understanding, not just memorizing it, for application questions on both the quizzes and tests. Atoms are the particles that make up all the elements. Each atom of a given element has the same chemical and physical properties, meaning each carbon atom in the universe is the same as any other carbon atom in the universe. There are subatomic particles that make up these atoms, protons shown in blue, neutrons shown in red, and electrons shown in green. Protons are positively charged, neutrons are not charged, and electrons are negatively charged. Neutrons and protons are found in the atomic nucleus, whereas electrons form a cloud around the nucleus. Protons are responsible for the unique chemical properties of each element. Next, we will focus on molecular structure and function and what role that plays in biology. To understand molecular structure and function, we will begin with a brief review of matter. As scientists, we need to understand matter. All tangible substances are made of matter. Matter occupies space and has mass. You can weigh it and measure it. Matter cycles within a system, and matter is different than energy, which flows through a system. Life on Earth requires both the cycling of matter and the flow of energy. Matter has potential energy, energy that exists because of its location or its structure, which is made up of chemical bonds. Matter has a tendency to remain at the lowest possible state of potential energy. Elements are pure substances made up of one kind of atom. Helium only has helium atoms, Hydrogen only has hydrogen atoms, and so on. They cannot be broken down into a simpler substance. There are 118 known elements, and 92 of them occur naturally. Each element is unique based on the protons found in the atomic nucleus. Of the 92 naturally occurring elements, Hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen make up 96% of all matter found in living organisms. There are trace elements that are required by organisms, and these requirements differ for each species. Essential elements, approximately one-fifth to a quarter of the natural elements, are necessary for life and reproduction among organisms. Living organisms are made up of a very small fraction of elements. In our daily lives, we do not encounter elements. We encounter compounds, which are substances made up of two or more elements combined in a specific ratio with chemical bonds. Compounds have a unique property, both chemical and physical, that differs from the element that make it up. For example, sodium chloride, table salt, has unique properties that are not found in the elements that make it up, sodium and chlorine. To further understand molecular structure and function, we need to review chemical bonding. A molecule shape is determined by chemical bonding. We are focusing on bonding because 
a molecule's shape has biological value. Each biological molecule has a specific shape that allows it to do its function. Again, this structure function relationship. And for most molecules, that shape is complex. A molecule shape is necessary to determine how that molecule will react with other molecules to result in a specific function. Take, for example, serotonin. This is a chemical released in certain regions of the brain that regulates mood and happiness. The molecular structure is shown for serotonin on the screen. When this neurotransmitter is released in the brain, it has a specific receptor to bind to in order for the brain to feel the effects of serotonin. Think of serotonin like a key, and its specific receptor is a lock. If any other molecule with another structure, in this case a different key, tries to bind to the serotonin receptor, the receptor doesn't recognize it, and the key cannot open the lock. This means that the new chemical cannot activate all the mechanisms that allow us to feel happy. Only serotonin can do that when it binds to its specific receptor. And the only reason it can bind to that receptor is because of its molecular structure. And this structure is a result of chemical bonding. Chemical bonds are chemical attractions that result in atoms staying close together. Today we're going to introduce several types of bonding, which are listed here. Covalent, single, double, nonpolar, polar, ionic, hydrogen, and van der Waals forces. Again, all of these types of chemical bonds are necessary for biology. Covalent bonds are formed when a pair of valence electrons is shared by two atoms. In the figure shown here, there are two hydrogen atoms sharing a pair of valence electrons represented by the yellow cloud around the positive atomic nucleus. When these valence electrons are shared, the hydrogens are covalently bonded. There are many types of covalent bonds. Single covalent bonds, double covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. Each of them has a unique set of properties. A single covalent bond is a pair of shared electrons. As expected then, a double bond is two pairs of shared electrons. Polarity refers to the overall change of an atom, so a nonpolar covalent bond is between two atoms of the same element. Because the atoms are the same element, the sharing of the electrons does not change the overall electronegativity of the atoms. One example is the hydrogen covalent bond, which would be a nonpolar covalent bond. However, when a covalent bond is formed between two atoms of differing elements and one atom is more electronegative than the other, the electrons are not shared equally, and this results in a polar covalent bond, which we'll discuss more when we get to our discussion on water. Next, we're going to look at ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are a different type of bond. This is where opposites attract. Cations, or positive charges, are attracted to anions, or negative charges. Salts are compounds that are formed by ionic bonds. The example on the figure shows a sodium cation attracted to a chloride anion, which results in sodium chloride compound. Hydrogen bonds are another form of bonds. These are weak, non-covalent attractions between hydrogen and electronegative atoms, usually nitrogen or oxygen. These bonds will be of importance to us as we study biology when we look at DNA structure. The last bond type that we're gonna discuss are van der Waals forces. These are a weak bond that occur when atoms or molecules are in very close proximity. These forces or interactions are the result of regions of positive and negative charges that change to enable other atoms and molecules to stick together. So to recap, chemical bonds are chemical attractions that result in atoms staying close together. Today we have covered covalent bonds, both single, double, nonpolar, and polar covalent bonds. We looked at ionic bonds, 
hydrogen bonds, and van der Waals forces. Finally, as we consider molecular structure and function, we want to discuss the properties of water. A water molecule is formed when two atoms of hydrogen bond covalently with an atom of oxygen. In a covalent bond, a pair of electrons are shared between the atoms. In water, the sharing is not equal, so this is a polar covalent bond. The oxygen atom attracts the electrons more strongly than the hydrogen. This gives water an asymmetrical distribution of charge. Because it because of its polar covalent bond, which gives water its unique structure, water has unique properties that are necessary for life. Water is polar, as we've mentioned, and at any given time, water tries to form hydrogen bonds with its neighbor. Water has four unique properties that enable life on Earth, and these are all based off of its unique structure. Adhesion and cohesion, temperature regulation, expansion on freezing, and solvents. First, adhesion and cohesion. Cohesion allows each molecule of water to attract neighboring molecules of water. This can allow for the upward pull against gravity from root to tip, distributing water and nutrients dissolved in that water throughout a living organism such as a tree, which is pictured Adhesion is the property of water that allows water molecules to attract other polar substances. Adhesion allows water to hydrogen bond to cell walls, which again helps counter the downward pull of gravity. So again, looking at these four necessary properties of water, we've looked at adhesion and cohesion, now we'll look at temperature modification. The specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for one gram of that substance to be changed by one degree Celsius. Water has a very high specific heat, which means a body of water can absorb and store a large amount of heat from the sun while only rising the temperature a few degrees. This can aid in moderating ocean temperatures, as well as moderating air temperatures in coastal areas, all of which create favorable conditions for marine life. The high specific heat of water and the fact that water covers most of the earth allows for temperature fluctuations on land that allow for biological life. So we've looked at adhesion and cohesion and temperature modification. Now we're going to look at the third of the four properties, expansion of water upon freezing. Water is one of just a few substances that are less dense as a solid. Because of this, ice floats. Pond, river, lake life relies on the ability of ice to float. If ice sank, all bodies of water would freeze from the bottom to the top, eventually killing off all aquatic life. But because ice floats, when a lake or a river does freeze, the ice is on top, allowing the aquatic life to continue below the surface of the ice. Finally, we're going to cover the fourth of the necessary properties of water. Water as a solvent. Water is one of the most versatile solvents because of its polarity. By way of reminder, when we're talking about a solution, we're talking about a mixture of two or more substances where the solvent is the liquid portion and the solute is what's dissolved in the solvent. An aqueous solution is one in which water is the solvent. Because of the polarity of water, water can attract positive solutes in the partially negative poles and negative solutes in the partially positive poles. Hydrophilic solutes attract water, and hydrophobic solutes repel water. Finally, in today's lecture, let's talk about chemical reactions. Biology is filled with chemical reactions between two or more reactants where there is a change in matter composition that results in a product. All of these chemical reactions are reversible. 
Two examples of biological chemical reactions are photosynthesis and cellular respiration, which is also known as the Krebs cycle. Shown in the top left is a plant cell. The chloroplasts are the ovals with green stacks in them. Photosynthesis occurs in chloroplasts. In photosynthesis, there is a light reaction requiring sunlight in a region of the chloroplast known as the thylakoid membranes. This reaction converts the energy of light to ATP and to NADPH. Then, in the Calvin cycle, which also takes place in the chloroplast, NADPH is used to reduce CO2 to glucose and other carbohydrates. As we mentioned, all reactions are reversible. Shown in the top right is an animal cell with the mitochondria as a pinkish orangish tube. The mitochondria are also depicted in the image below the animal cell. The Krebs cycle is another example of biological chemical reaction. The Krebs cycle is necessary for cellular respiration, a chemical reaction used to generate energy, ATP, for the cell to use as an energy source. Today we talked about atoms, molecular structure and function, and chemical reactions. If you have any questions about this lecture or information in your textbook that supports this lecture, please reach out to your professor through email or office hours or bring your questions to class. Also consider visiting the learning assistants for this class who are ready to support you as you journey through this class. Now that you've finished the lecture, combine your notes from this lecture with notes from the textbook that you took. As you read through the ARQs, also consider using the questions at the end of each section in the chapter, as well as the questions at the end of the chapter as a way to quiz yourself to prepare for the quiz and for the test.